The On The Mark podcast is brought to you in part by Synovus. Synovus, the bank of here. Here is the most important place to your bank because here is where you are. Synovus, the bank of here. Welcome to On The Mark, a PGA Tour podcast. Here's your host, someone who walks inside the ropes but thinks outside the box, Mark Immelman. Rolling right along here with this On The Mark podcast. How's it? I am Mark Immelman. Welcome if you're new to our tribe, our global tribe, so glad to have you. If you're a long-time listener, go ahead and tweet us, please. I want to hear from you. Let us know where you are listening from. The handle there on Twitter is at OnTheMarkRadio. Of course, you can reach out to me at at Mark underscore Immelman or give us a follow on Instagram at Mark underscore Immelman. As I said, the PGA Tour season rolling right along. Congratulations to Bryson DeChambeau, Bridgestone golf player who won Jack Nicklaus's Memorial Tournament last week. Once again, a super event, and I was honored and had a lot of fun to be a part of that PGA Tour live broadcast covering some of the great players playing around one of the PGA Tour's great golf courses. And speaking of great golf courses, it's Memphis week, the FedEx St. Jude um, Classic Wonderful event there in Memphis, Tennessee. One of my favorite stops at the TPC Southwind, Beale Street in Memphis. Great music, great barbecue. It's it's a good spot. It's hot, and it really is fun in the week leading into the U.S. Open. And look forward to some really cool podcasts we got upcoming to uh, get you set up for that U.S. Open. Also, I spoke with Ratif Hurson, 04 winner at Shinnecock Hills, and he spoke about battling Phil Mickelson down the stretch. He spoke about the mindset required to win U.S. Opens and major champions and also spoke about that harrowing incident in his life where he was struck by lightning as a young man. So insightful and interesting stuff there from the goose. Um, You can also, in the meantime, to get yourself set up, we've got the 2017 uh, U.S. Open champ Brooks Kepka in our uh, Cash of podcast. Just go to your wherever you get your podcasts at iTunes or Stitcher or TuneIn or at PGATour.com slash podcasts or at PGATour.com slash on the mark and, and search for Brooks Kepka. Uh, lots of great lessons there from Brooks, Brooks talking about how he learned the game, what he believes is important, how he gets power. And I know each and every one of you would like to hit the ball a little more powerfully off the tee. Now, speaking of power, a few weeks ago, well, first off, to set this up, George Gankus has been on our podcast before. He's a member of our tribe. He's Gucci, as he says. uh, And the listen is fascinating if you're going to look for it in our cache of podcasts. But a few weeks ago, and again, I'm dating this. I shouldn't, given that this podcast lives in the internet forever. Um, Go and look through our cache and you will find George's podcast. But in 2018 at the NCAA Division I National Championships, there was a young man called Matthew Wolf who turned a lot of heads. He's a young man who's been taught by George Gankus, and I knew about him. I'd looked at him. I'd watched him on social media. And then the one evening after a broadcast, I was just lying in the hotel room watching some of the, the NCAA Division I um, matches on television, the highlights, and Matthew got up there and was dusting a competitor and hit the three wood off the tee with some of the launch monitor measurements. And this thing, the ball was launched at 178 miles an hour. That's with a three wood. And just to put that into perspective, average on the PGA Tour with a driver is about 167 miles an hour or so. So this young man cranks it faster with a three wood than folks do with a driver. And you know what was initially a situation early in the week where a bunch of the pundits looked upon this golf swing which is kind of uh, Matthew's own. Uh, We've done a podcast like that before with Jeff Leishman, who teaches Daniel Berger, who's won in Memphis two years in a row. Go look for that. It's about swinging your swing. I reached out straight away to George and I said, I want to talk about this because I'm a big one for people remaining true to who they are. And I have a high respect for golf instructors who help people to use what they have and not necessarily go about retooling everything. And George was like, by all means, I would love to chat. This conversation, (laughs) there's a lot of stuff that he levels at you. So get the pen and paper handy. But it is good for your game. I promise you it's loaded up with golf tips. And it's going to be so beneficial. This segment of the On The Mark podcast is brought to you by Synovus. Synovus, the bank of hero. 
George Gankus, uh, are you spending more studio time than I am, big guy? What's going on in your neck of the woods there? <laughs> a lot, actually. Just working a bunch, enjoying uh, watching um, some good golf. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, now listen, before we get into uh, all the good golf and a bunch of the guys you work with, tell us a little bit about the new venture, because I'm watching on social media, I see you behind a camera, it looks like all sorts of new content coming out. What's going there? What's going on? Well, my old uh, business partner and I, um, we had some disagreements, and so we ended our relationship. Um, and so I'm starting my own membership um, site. Uh, it's going to be George Gankis Golf. Mm -hmm. So I'm just working in the studio bunch on new content, um, a lot of cool new stuff. So I'm excited because it is completely um, – I wouldn't say completely, but there's a lot of new stuff that adds on – to what I did before um, because I hadn't updated any of that old stuff for two years. So okay. it's, it's, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say it's outdated, but there's some outdated stuff that, you know, matchups and cool stuff that you add to it. So you don't get yourself in trouble. Cause I see a lot of people trying to do certain things that I teach mm -hmm. and they're way off. So it, it'll be cool to clear up some, some stuff in the air and it, it'll be good for them. Okay. In the interest of keeping this current, because this is a podcast, uh, I'm, 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 I'm sure there's a website that people go to, to get this. Yeah. It's George Gankis golf. So awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, sure, man. Look, I look forward to getting it. The last time you were on our podcast, yeah, part of our tribe, the numbers went nuts because folks just wanted to hear from you. And then here recently at the 2018 NCAAs, I'd been hearing you talk about Matthew Wolf, but we got eyes on this young stud the first time and he blew the doors off the thing. So I want you to start a little bit there because the thing that I saw in this kid and then I thought of you and I actually tweeted about it, I'm like, Kudos to George Gankus for helping this young man to remain true to who he is. So I want just some opening thoughts there from you, please. Uh, opening thoughts on Matt, Matthew Wolf as a golfer or his golf swing or everything? Well, everything, because I know he joined you when he was still just a, a youngster getting into high school. And, and I appreciated you, George, because you know me. I'm a big one for a person doing what they're able to do. And I appreciate you looking at this and going, okay, this is what this youngster does. And we're just going to kind of fine tune what he does here and not get into what he uh, get into him with a scalpel, really. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's looking at golf swing, uh, you know, that, that they want to make it look aesthetically pleasing. And if it's not, it doesn't work. And that's absolute garbage. Mm -hmm. um, and it always will be garbage to me. Um, because if your bottom is good, bottom meaning through the impact area is good, and your pressure shift is good, I don't, I don't care what the backswing looks like as long as it's optimal for speed mm -hmm. um, and it's optimal to create, you know, good swing direction in the downswing and good numbers, I, I'm all for it. So it doesn't have to look like, you know, the prettiest swing in the world for it to be efficient. And, and we see it's just like artwork. How many, how many paintings are sold that, that look perfect? Yeah, you're right. Not man. many. Mm-hmm. I am right on that one because all the all the ones that look freaky or have some kind of weird, you know, weird things going on are the ones that are making the big money. No, you true, know what I mean? no doubt, man. Well, listen, I watched him play. I'd seen some videos of yours on social media of him, uh, and and there are a few areas I want to start um, talking about Matthew now. The youngster that comes to you, did he have that speed naturally? Because I was watching some of the NCA footage and I saw this boy crank it up to 178 mile an hour with a three wood off the tee, ball speed that is. And I was like, holy smokes. I mean, was this always natural or was this something you helped him to achieve? No, 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 no. I mean, there were some things that he definitely did natural. He was a baseball player, number one. Okay. Um, so he had his foot off the ground when he came to me. He, he was crossed up. Um, his, his through the ball area was very, very stalled out. Like he, he was like right now he's very open, but he pushes up off the ground so hard that his feet get airborne. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and when, when Matt, what, uh, went to swing catalyst or swing catalyst actually came to him at Oklahoma, um, they found out that he had 298%, um, vertical forces, um, Holy smokes. and he Jeez. was pushing like, which is ridiculous. Yes. Um, so, so they, they called me to tell me, I said, I already knew that he moves mats on my driving range and he, he, he just doesn't like hitting off mats because the, the mat actually moves in the middle of the swing. The ball moves off the, off the tee when he's hitting. Really? So 
he's been pushing the ground for a long, long time. Just when he was a little kid, I mean, I was with him when he was 13. So he was, I mean, he's probably five one, five two, weighing about 120 pounds, 130 when I first met him. Mm-hmm. So was he killing the ball? No, he was way dumped under. He's probably about 14 degrees under, hitting big sling hooks, uh, blocks and hooks. And so when I saw it, I already de- dealt with a couple players that were across the line. And I saw how they matched it up with a good body pivot. And I said, you know, instead of changing this kid's natural move, it's so cool. Um, I'd rather keep a lot of it and, and fix his, you know, through the impact area. Yeah. Um, then, then make him look pretty. And, and, and as soon as I told him that, he's like, you're my coach. He's like, everybody's trying to change that. And I'm like, yeah, of course they are. But but I, I, I really enjoy it. I think it's it's really cool. Well, look, uh, that, that was something you referenced after all the success uh, in the NCAAs. Obviously, was in the U.S. Junior Amateur Final as well. And he referenced the fact that he owes it all to you. And that's why we reached out to you. Now, a few questions sort of uh, spurn from your observations there. The first thing is this, and now I'm talking for the parents listening to this conversation, and they're like, all right, George has helped the stud kid to success in the collegiate ranks. Um, you say he was hitting the blocks and the sling hooks. Are you of the opinion this, yeah. that this is not a bad place for some young kid to be because you'd rather hit them hit that sort of shape than go in the opposite direction when they're learning the game? I think that every kid that I've ever taught, this will sound interesting, we're, we're all taught these releases that we're supposed to go into flexion a little ulnar, and that'll create some forearm roll at the bottom, and then turn back through it and go into extension and learn that little release, that pattern. But, but uh-huh. to me, I would much rather see a kid roll the left forearm, roll, like flip it, or go into supination of the left hand, all the same thing. Left hand just going into flip, mm-hmm. right hand going into pronation. And getting a player to get into out and learn to hook the ball first from into out. Right. Those have been always my very best players because all I have to do is add rotation to that. And the handle starts to move more forward. So they, they their dynamic loft goes down, their compression gets better. And, and then their path to face ratio stay better. Rather than learning to what people call a drive hold where you're holding on to it, but the face is open and then, what that causes is people, the whole angle and the ball goes right. So they start changing swing directions and start coming over the top. And then, then they start even adding loft to score the face. So mm-hmm. I would much rather see a kid from under and flip hooking without a doubt. Cause to, to learn rotation from there is easy. Yeah. So your contention is that, that, that sort of under quick release of the wrist there can get sort of improved if you will, just by a, improving rotation through the golf ball for folks trying to make uh, sense of what we're talking about. Yeah. It depends on what type of rotation you're talking about. Rotation without linear motion or just pure rotation. I have to see what rotation is the person in their own mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cause I, some, some people who show me the rotation that their upper body's moving forward and, and it's crazy. And some people they rotate on their back foot. I mean, so if it's done properly with rotation and, and you're mixing your remedy in a little bit of linear with a little bit of angular motion or a little bit of rotation with a little bit of, Chip, yeah, then I love it. I yeah, absolutely right. love it. No, Gucci. All right, another question. You you speak of the, the, the vertical height users on the ground. It was mind-blowing for me to watch this youngster. But then when I watched him gear one down with a wedge, he was plugged into the ground. He was real stable. The management of the speed looked sound. And everything was just a bit more geared down. I, I, I want you to talk a little bit about how you and Matthew have worked on this high speed with the big clubs to this controlled speed with the more touch stuff? Well, since we, since we very first started, you know, he was hitting sling hooks. So the first project was to get him left just a little bit more. Um, and okay. that was with rotation. So we did that first through like rotation, 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 which is interesting because let's just give a, a quick example to, to the people out there. His path was, let's say, 14 degrees to the right at start. And his face was roughly around seven, eight, nine degrees hitting a draw back to the target okay. um and so it was cool so when i started getting his path more to the left what happened was his face was still out about six seven eight degrees mm-hmm. the ball was just starting to go straight left so we had to start moving his face accordingly left from his address position so he laid the face wide open flipped it back and all the rest so we gradually started going left and moving the face along to match up with the path like so that, that was 
that was fun. That was our first project. So after that, the speed part hey, can of it. I, can, can I stop you real fast? Oh, hold, hold on a sec. To that, okay. because there's an emotional and a mental battle that goes with that, especially for a talented young golfer. You start getting better numbers on the uh, launch monitor pathwise, but you're seeing the golf ball go hard left because that face is still out of whack. How did you guys work to keep him sort of G'd up about this and like, oh, dang, my golf swing's going in the tank? No, well, it, it happened really – I under, he understood the numbers because I put okay. sticks on the ground. I made him understand, like, the ratios between path and face. Um, and so he understood that, you know, he was swinging left to the right and more to the left, and then he was leaving the face off to the right, so the ball was now starting to go straight instead of draw. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't hooking it under the situation. I just appropriately started bringing his face. I said, now get your face a little more left, face a little more left, face a little more left. And so we gradually started to tone it down to where his numbers in high school became a path of four and his face two. Okay. So we had some signs out in front. I have numbers on my range that are a degree apart. It's kind of interesting. So he knew what two degrees was. So he knew that that's where his ball was roughly starting. We all know that the ball doesn't start 100% on face, but it was roughly around two degrees out to the right. Mm -hmm. His ball would turn back to the flag. So he started seeing the kind of, like, the pattern he was creating. And his visuals on the course, he was taking that, that he'd say, hey, I'm going to aim 150 and turn back to the 100 sign. And he started seeing visuals on the course. So he didn't have swing thoughts. He started having visuals ah, from cool. just understanding ball flight laws. So it's very interesting that he wasn't mechanical as much as he was visual about what his ball was doing. Hey, I wanna, like a bubba. Yeah, I like that. And, and, and I want to visit that a bit more. You, you say you've got the signs on your range. This, to me, is fascinating. Now, George, I, um, now it's the, you, you, you sort of spur, I'm spurring the teacher in me on. So you've basically create an environment where you've measured what two degrees is extended, I guess, down the range face wise. And then you have targets out yeah, there. So I mean, folks obviously, can see it. obviously two degrees you, you're looking at, you know, from 80 yards out is, well, I, I, I'm guessing about six feet, right. But mm -hmm. if you do two degrees out at 150, I'm That's guessing farther right. probably 15, 20 feet, you know, even mm -hmm. maybe more. Um, but, yeah, it's, we could see a degree sign where the ball was start line. Yes. Gotcha. So how do I know that? I used to hit a ball straight at it, and it'd say path two, face two, mm, cool. um, if I hit a dead straight ball at each sign. So I knew where degree was so from, from, my, from my target location. Yeah. Hey, don't you I, you? I think that for folks listening to this that practice with launch monitors, I think that that's an awesome way to practice to sort of – Take what you're seeing in the launch monitor and, like Matthew did, take it to the course and start to develop your feels out of this. Oh, 100%. I mean, that, that is where, where he started. And he knew why the ball overhooked. It wasn't his face closing down because the ball was starting online. He knew that his swing direction was more right, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, once he understood that, he knew what he was hooking and he needed to swing more left with rotation. So, or change his body lines, or change his ball position. He started getting real creative with it, and now it's just more of like a feel thing for him. He's not gotcha. a, a guy that's sitting on trackman every day and looking at his numbers. He, he's not that guy, but for, for when we started, he definitely was. I see. So he used the trackman to develop his sense for it. So, so here's the thing. So when he comes back from college, back to California there, uh, the things you guys work on, is it more just management of where he is or is there continual evolution of this golf swing? That's a great question. You know, the only thing that he needs to think about now is, is, is rotation through the ball because he gets a little bit like stuck through the bottom area that you could see. He doesn't release his neck or his chest. Mm -hmm. But the interesting part is at impact, his chest is open roughly around 30 degrees. His hips are open at least 45. Wow. Um, so, so let's just look at that as like a, a math equation. Let's say his path is zero, his face is zero, and he likes hitting a straight ball. Let's just give you a hypothetical. Well, what is the problem with stalling out after the ball's gone? There isn't one. Mm -hmm. The problem with it is if you back out of a ball and your path swings more right and the face tends to close because post-impact you, you hook it, then you got some problems. Yeah. He's not a guy that backs out of a ball too much. So, so <laughs> not with that not, speed of grids, no. <laughs> no, nah, he's, he's not backing way out of a ball so much that, that that's affecting anything. You're not seeing him quick hook anything. As a matter of fact, I only saw him miss 
one fairway in the three days I was there. Um, and that's the truth. I think he might have missed four fairways the whole six days. Wow. Um, and that's incredible to me. No doubt. So, so he's not missing the ball all, all over the place. So when you ask me the question, is it management now? Yeah, it's, it's straight up he's the least – he, he's probably a guy that I have to least put any kind of like management into, Hey, you need to go this place or you need to have to do this. Yeah, uh -huh. He's a guy right now that I love where his golf swings at. And as long as his setup's right, his balance points are good and he continues to work on his rotation. There's not a lot more to do except for manage other parts of his game and his mind. Okay. Now, the folks listening to this are like, oh, this is cool sounding stuff and that, but they're all thinking about their own games because they'll want to shoot lower. That's why they download this. So you keep talking rotation, and I'm sure there are a few folks that has someone said to them, you, you stalled through contact, there's not enough rotation. Share a cool drill, just something generic that they can go and try in the driving range when they're going to hit some more golf balls. For, for rotation wise, yeah, through the golf ball. Well, back and through. Oh, okay. So first off, the main reason that people don't rotate is their face is wide open. Yeah. So, so if you do rotate, the ball's going right. Okay. So understand if the face is more on the shut side, you have to turn, or the ball's going to go left. Okay. Mm -hmm. So once players understand that, make sure that their face, when their shaft is parallel in the downswing, which most people call P six, yeah, is at least square to your back line. Okay. Now, mine is not. Okay, mine is toe up, but I'm a late flexor, and I'm I actually go into ulnar, which is a release with a combination of flexion and the downswing, which equals a little form rotation, and my handles on my left shoe. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I'm I would be a hypocrite saying that you have to have your face, you know, square to your back line in the downswing. Well, you're not both. I mean, you, you, you that would be a, you're talking to me over there. Yeah. I'm 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 the same thing basically. So your toes up, and you still get it down because uh, that's yeah. the way we were taught. Mm-hmm. So if, if we're a guy that, that we're starting out new, I'd say, hey, try and get your leading edge square to your back line when the shaft's parallel and use your pivot. And when I say move your pivot, just imagine that your belt buckle is in the middle of your feet at address. Okay. Push pressure forward. Push your pressure forward into your left hip about a ball, like, like a golf ball size. So you have pressure forward and feel like your head stays centered and you open your hips about 45 degrees and chest open about 30. No, 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 no. Easy, easy, Tiger. Uh, uh, what you're describing, I'm seeing in young Math, Matt Wolf, that little pre-swing trigger thing he's got going on, that little, or, or, you know, for me, I learned from Gary Player, there was always the knee kick and the little <laughs> rotation. Is this what you're saying? Well, that's exactly how he got it. He got it because he was closed, and then I said, go to impact. And then he started any impact and then back and he just put it in. He says, can I keep doing that? And I said, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I, said, I love it. I love it. I said, if you hit, if you hit it that good, you can do whatever you want is what I told him. Exactly. Oh, uh, dude, you're, you're preaching. Okay. Wait, I, I interrupted you. Sorry to the folks. Sorry to you. So you were describing this little drill for those folks that haven't seen Matt Wolf play and haven't seen this little trigger, if you will. So you say you start with a belt buckle at a dress and then you feel the pressure move into your forward heel some talk talk a little bit a little bit more about that drill please okay well basically i'm just presetting you into an impact so when i say a ball it's just kind of like a checkpoint how far forward you move from address position so let's say someone's address position is their pelvis is in the middle of their feet meaning their belt buckle is not towards their left foot like mm -hmm. they're not putting pressure presetting forward okay but if you had your belt in the middle and your head's pretty centered or it could be tilted a little bit but you push a little pressure forward on your left side and you pushed about as far as like a golf ball or an inch and a half. And then you turn your hip, but kept your hip on that wall and you had your head stay centered, which means you'd have some right little bend. Your left leg is straight up mm -hmm. again a little hey, bit. That's key. That, turn, that's, that's key there, right? Because so many folks do this and their upper body just drifts toward the target as well. And then they basically stuffed. Well, that, that's the detail you have to get in. The, the left side of the pelvis has to be higher at impact yeah. than the right side. But in transition, the left side of the pelvis is lower, then it gets back to level, then it tilts. But what tilts it is a combination of a push-off trail leg and a little bit of extension in the left leg. Not a lock-up, but a little extension with maintaining rotation and keeping your right little bend. Now, on video, while we're talking or on this podcast, 
it's impossible for somebody who doesn't know what I'm talking about to relay it. Of course. But make it simple. Get pressure forward and turn your chest open about 30. Keep your head centered, which means you'd have a little right bend and a little push-up trail. Mm-hmm. And, and get your hips open a little bit. And then start at that position. Take it back to where I said, which was P6 or shaft parallel. And get that, that the leading edge square to your back. And then just move right back into that impact. And just start hitting little pitch shots nice. with that. And it'll give you a really good sense of what impact should feel like. And then if you can get back to that position from any backswing and you can move it back there and get back to that impact, that's what it's really about in a lot of ways. Because Mm -hmm. let's say you move off so far in the backswing and you can't get back to that impact and you're stuck on your back foot. None of that stuff matters. That's true. So does that mean you have to to learn to pressure shift more forward or or not move off so much in your backswing? That's up to your coach. You know what I mean? Of, of how you go about it. But in general, that's a good little kind of thing that Matt Wolf did. Yeah, it really is. And it's cool too. And and it sort of gets me thinking. And and it was odd as I watched the progression through watching this event on television, the NCA as that is, in 2018. You know, initially folks were like, whoa, how's this boy? You know, if people, the pundits who didn't see the swing, um, hadn't seen it before, hadn't seen him hit the golf ball. Then all of a sudden he starts whipping up on guys. He's unbeaten. He's killing it around the place there. And all of a sudden his swing goes from eye-opening and different to on social media was talking about how cool this kid was, how cool his swing was and such. So I, I want you to sort of bring a little California explanation to this cool thing because Matt Wolf, the golf swing is different. But once you look at it for a bit, it becomes cool. And I thought as folks watched it, it became cool because of his personality for one, but just the way that he hit the golf ball secondly. Yeah. Well, Matthew, Matthew has a lot of swag. The kid, the kid walks around with a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, He knows how good he is. He also knows that he's not a cocky kid at all. I've instilled a lot of confidence in him. And, and, you know, I, I give him trigger words like stuff that you'd be surprised with what I couldn't tell you guys on, on the podcast. <laughs> just because that, that gives, that gives him confidence. I know it is funny, but, but it, it's things that he needs to get his mind, right. Things to get his confidence, you know, where it needs to be. And it's cool because I can still do this for, you know, amateurs, but pros, you know, I don't, I don't do that for pros because they, they have their own mindset. They have their own thing. If they asked me to do it, you'd be surprised with how many of these guys would be a lot better off. But, you know, I, I, I'm not going to jump into their business and go, hey, why don't you start thinking like this? You mm-hmm. know, because they come to me for golf swing. But, the, you know, if you know me, you know I'm a lot more than golf swing. Yeah, you really are. Okay, a couple more questions. Thanks for your time. I know you Wait, parked... wait, wait, wait. I didn't answer your question. I'm sorry. All right. I, is that okay? No, please go ahead, bro. Matthew, where it comes cool. What comes cool is that, you know, he, he was unsure if, if his swing was okay when he was growing up from 13 to 16 because just like you said, people were like, what is this? This is whack. This is crazy. Mm-hmm. Some people are like, this, this is just not okay. Get him left across the line. What are you doing? And so I ensured in him or I installed in his brain that his swing was the coolest and it will change golf and he will be a trend center. He will actually change golf the way it's looked at rather than hey you have to hide the hands in the glove or you have to hide the club in the glove or you have to be laid off or you have to have your club at ball line i said that's garbage that has nothing to do with anything i said you are going to change golf because right now it's going back into that you have to aesthetically look pleasing in order to play golf which is garbage Mm -hmm. and more garbage yeah that is such cool stuff because you know me i mean now everybody's saying now everybody's saying what his swing is the coolest. Oh yeah, yeah it, absolutely. I said anybody. If people are going to try and break you down too, they're going to say, you know, you're going to have a bad week or two, and someone's going to tell you in college, dude, if you get a little less cross, you're going to be better. And I said, do not listen to that. If you get in a slump, you just keep doing what you're doing. Do not listen to anybody changing a golf swing because consistency for him is coming from his brain. It's in the fact that he believes over and over, and he thinks the same thing over every shot, where everybody else is thinking something different over every shot. That's he the has truth. the same mind frame coming into every single ball. That's why he's so consistent. So understand that for the crowd out there, for the, the guys on the podcast here. 
understand that consistency doesn't come from your golf swing. It comes from your mind. You can have some garbage ball flight, but if you shut your brain off, you'll get that same ball flight over and over. You just might not like it, but you would be consistent. Oh man, you know what? You you always bring sermon, big guy, and that you were preaching right there. I'm I'm almost I'm almost nervous to speak because that was your insights there. All of them are always great, but your insights right there about being consistent in your mind and how you view yourself is really one of the most important things. And it brings me to one one, one more question, real fast. Um, I've I've watched you from afar, and then then I watched Johnny Ruiz, who is a complete flusher, and he's got a lot of the same sort of tendencies that Matt Wolf does. So I want your commentary there too. Sure. Well, uh, Johnny Ruiz came back from Canada three years ago, or two and a half years ago. I, I mean, maybe it was two years, two years ago, and he says, "Dude, I want to redo my swing," and I'm like, "Why?" He goes. I want to look like Matt Wolf, and I just started laughing. <laughs> Are you kidding me, really? And I was like, "Are you serious?" And he goes, "Yeah." I said, "Well, I could do that for you, no problem." Well, you know what kind of year he had last year? He had an unbelievable year. Mm -hmm. um, he's struggling this year with the putting and the wedges, and we got to get him on it. I need to start traveling more, and he knows that. But that's basically how he he changed his swing is he copied Matt Wolf. Wow. That wasn't his natural, but that wasn't me telling him. So all all the viewers out there. Who, who are listening and thinking that I'm making people get across the line. It just so happens that some of my best ball strikers are across the line, and I didn't, I didn't make them change it. Because if you are across the line and you pivot properly, that shaft will lay back behind you. That club head will lay back behind you always. But if you decide to get across and pull your hands down, yes, it's not a good matchup. Mm -hmm. But if you use your pivot properly from across the line, it is not danger. I promise okay. you. You will not block or hook it. The only reason you're going to block or hook it is because your pivot's off and you're standing up and, and doing dumb things. <laughs> mm. Well, I think back in the day, Miller Barber, he had one that was severely across the line and he could drive it up a Nat's rear end because he got that thing shallowing, like you say. I, I think everybody who has crossed the line back in the day that we know of were amazing ball strikers. Fred and Couples? So I, I, hmm? do, I, we, I, do I have to keep going? Keep, me, yeah, Snead, exactly. I could... I could go on and on. Well, look. How, you, about, how about Jimmy Bruin? Jimmy Bruin. Have you ever seen that guy swings exactly like Matt Wolf? And he was apparently one of the best ball strikers. Well, look, uh, you're one of the best instructors, and I appreciate you pulling off to the side of a California road so you can talk to us, big guy. You're a superstar. Um, once again, just share the, the social media handles and, and where folks can find more from you, please. Oh, so George Gankis Golf is my new handle. I am no longer associated with GG Swing Tips whatsoever. Uh, it's George Gankis Golf now. Um, I am on Instagram. Um, I have a new YouTube coming out right now, and I have a new membership site. So you can go to George Gankis Golf um, and check it all out. It's going to be launching in the, the next month and a half here with a new membership site. So I'm excited about it. All this new context, context coming out, and I've been working on it for about – three four months now all right brother keep styling you're the man thank you so much for your time and having me on the show this segment of the on the mark podcast was brought to you by synovus synovus the bank of here well that was gucci wasn't it george what a beauty pulled over honestly to the side of a road so they could take our phone call so we could bring you that great stuff. And I just want to put a little bow on that and say to you, the great Nick Price, who for my money is one of the best ball strikers ever to play this game, he used to do a little preset sort of an impact thing like that where he would set the face. He wouldn't just do the pivots like like uh, Matt Wolf does. He'd set the face behind the golf ball. He'd sort of de-loft it lean on the shaft a bit, get the face turned a smidge inwards, and then he would rotate the body on that to sort of get the lead arm against the chest. Um, and then from there, he'd get the sense, he'd swing back a little bit, as George Gankus said, and then go through and deliver, trying to deliver the club through impact the same way. It's a super, super way to get a feel for how the club needs to perform through impact. And yes, you can then do whatever you got to do in the other areas of the swing to facilitate so you can Use the create matchups, as Shaheen Nakjavani would say. You can find that podcast from him in our cache at pgatour.com slash podcasts or wherever you go. Um, you can get the Nick Price podcast in there too. And there's great stuff in there from Pricey talking about how, you know, 
how he did certain shots and how he preset the face and and how he he played and won major championships and such. So go and look for Nick Price there in our Kasha podcast too. But I guess the takeaway from all of this is that if your swing matches up well, even if it doesn't look top drawer, you know it's okay. I think of a Shane Lowry. He gets the club across the line, hands a little deep at the top, but he shallows it beautifully and hits the prettiest draws you've ever seen. There are a number of golfers. Fred Couples, we talked about, Sam Sneed, now young Matt Wolf. And as George Gankus said, you might be a trendsetter. So I want to say to you, anyone listening to this, yours might be yours. Swing your swing, as the great Arnold Palmer said. You may be a trendsetter. You must just ensure, though, that you know what happens in your swing and what you need to work on so that when things go bad, because they will, you don't go chopping and changing and making all sorts of adjustments. Everyone has their sweet spot. And if you understand what makes you you, and then when things go off, what you need to do, not just start grasping at straws, you have a chance to be a trendsetter. And think of the big trendsetters in the game as it pertained to golf swinging. Swinging, Of course, there was Bob Jones. Of course, there was Ben Hogan, Byron Nelson, Nick Faldo, Tiger Woods. Maybe it's Matt Wolf next. It could be you. Make sure you understand you. And that is why we exist. We want to bring you these minds on this podcast so that you can get the best information so that you can make your decisions and make them appropriately so you don't go about getting better and then suddenly ruining yourself. We had guests on this podcast before, I think of Paul McGinley, who in an effort to get better, did some of the wrong things. And as he looks back on it now, as he's wise, he's like, man, I wouldn't have done that. So know where you're going, know who you are, know what's necessary, get as much information on the thing as you can, and then get some good counsel. As you do from this podcast, go ahead and share it with your friends. Get out, play golf, have lots of fun, make lots of birdies, and you take it easy. This broadcast and all associated rights, including copyright, are owned exclusively by the PGA Tour and may not be used in whole or in part without the prior written permission of the PGA Tour. Synovus is the bank of here. Here is a fairway that took shape before engines replaced horses. Here's where some days you lay up and others you just go for it. Here's where you don't even need a tea time. And here's where a casual conversation on the back nine turns into a successful business expansion. Here should be the most important place to your bank because here is where you are. Synovus, the bank of here. Banking products provided by divisions of Synovus Bank. Member FDIC, equal housing lender.